I'm Peter, and I'm here with Jason. Yo, my people, what's up? And Steve. Hey, everyone. Although for anyone on the um, the YouTube channel, it says Peter and Mike, because I think he's trying to mess with Jason already. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I'm also here with Colin. Hello, hello. And Mike. Hey, hey. And Barrett, what's up? Greetings. Barrett, my new favorite game buddy. We're KDM yes. buddies. We are. Ha <laughs> <laughs> Trying to go a whole new campaign. Yeah, no, no. Oh, you, you know what, Jason? I'm guessing you've never played KDM. I'm the only other person that rated it, fool. Look at the spreadsheet. Oh, okay. So wait, what are you what are you snoring for? That game is like amazing. Peter, did, play play it more than once. I'm not saying you're wrong, but play it more than once. I've played you four, three, three times now. That opinion about yeah, right? it. I played play it three times. times. Yes, in the last couple of days. That's what I'm telling you. I'm uh, okay. I'm, I'm all in. Barrett's got me hooked. Yeah, well, talk to me after your 20th Lantern Year and your yeah. 15th Lion Fight. And I'm not saying you won't like it, but you might not. <laughs> I'm just waiting for him to fight the butcher the first time and really get, yeah. some, get, get, a, get start a start the podcast at some point. Some fun. I have. We're doing have, a podcast. Oh, is that what we're doing? I thought it was a Zoom meeting. We are doing the podcast. This is it. Hello? This is the banter, Jason. Can anyone Come hear on, me? man. Mm, okay. Okay. So this podcast is top 100 cooperative games. So if you tuned into episode 198, 199, and 100 on the One Stop Co-op Shop podcast and Shelf Stories, you will know that we, all of us, made our top 100 games. And we smashed them together, aggregate style. And we just went over the top 50 because we didn't feel like being here all day. However, people are curious about what didn't make the list. As a matter of fact, in a lot of ways, it's um, uh, more interesting for people, for games that did not, like, did not make the list. A, because of hidden gems. And B, because of perceived travesties, which we will get to. <laughs> yeah there's there at least one that games, is a travesty there were a couple of games that were travesties and so we what we've done is we have uh we're gonna put together two more episodes uh over on, it'll be on shelf stories on wednesday uh or, or both ch channels on wednesday and then um on sunday as well just like the regular schedule so we are going to do best of the rest what we're going to do is we're going to take our favorites and i have I looked at it and said six favorites from each person uh so we're going to do 18 up 18 favorites this episode then we're gonna do 18 next episode and by then you'll have so many co-ops for your face <laughs> i mean that's a lot that is of a lot of goodness <laughs> this is best of the rest and we'll, it won't even cover a, a few games will have dropped off here so uh we are going to um let you know before we get started that the one-stop co-op shop is an empire we are a youtube show we are a podcast we are uh we have a Discord channel. I mentioned the Discord because the spreadsheet is posted in the podcast channel. So you can see the whole spreadsheet right now as we speak, but we are going to sift out our favorites. All right. So we are going to do best of the rest. Uh, so I'm going to go up the list. So I'm going to announce the number and I'm going to announce a game. And then whoever is belongs to that game, whoever has it most highly rateable, you know, break it down like we did last time, tell them, give you the buzzwords and then give you what they love about the game. And then we'll have a banter. And in this particular case, we're probably going to disagree a lot more because the <laughs> nature of this part of the list is this, this game, these games are somebody's favorite and other people either didn't rate them at all or didn't play them at all, or just bleh. And I'm looking to my uh, lower right over here because I feel like Michael Kelly is going to be bringing some uh, fire and brimstone on some of these games. He's ready, right? Well, he I mean, already that's... did with KDM, and it's not even going to be on the list because we already <laughs> talked about it. No, no, I, I like KDM a lot. I just think you don't have enough experience yet to say whether you like it. <laughs> well, I'm not reviewing it yet. I'm just happy with my first few plays. That is for darn sure. I There's did me. get tired of the lion. So uh, sorry, Baron. It's a lot of lion. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of lion. <laughs> it's a lot of lion. All right. So we are going to get started. We're going to get started with number 166, the lowest favorite on this list. It's a pretty low, and I'm the only one who rated it. Uh, I just put this game, a playthrough of this game, just put it on the one-stop co-op shop, uh, or it will have been just put on there by the time we uh, launch this. Uh, perhaps Michael Kelly took a look at the video. I have no idea. Everybody else, nobody else has even any idea this game exists. However, it is one of my favorite real-time games. It is a hidden gem, if there was ever a hidden gem. It is now boarding now boarding is the real time game from tim fowers uh, of burgle brothers fame so once burgle brothers hit i'm like all right tim fowers you can do no wrong let's bring it on and now boarding is 
I just think so much fun. It's it's a pickup and deliver game. It's just, it's just like airlines, you pick up passengers and then you deliver them. And it's kind of that split phase thing. So like you're planning, uh, you know, you're it's like, I, I, I know where my, my passion going to go. Are you going to pick up here? You're going to pick up there. And, but some of the passengers, you, you know where they are, but you don't know where they're going. You, then the time phase starts and then you flip all the cards and it's like, okay, th this person go to JFK and this person go over here. Uh, you bring this person over to O'Hare and I'm going to pick up this person from O'Hare and I'm going to bring them to San Francisco and you got to talk that out. Da, 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 da. And then ah, you see how you messed it up <laughs> and, <you sit laughs> and then more, and then more passengers come in and, and then, and, and there we go. Uh, so Sounds I like adore space alert. It is, it's like a baby space alert. It's not as, it's not as crazy as space alert. Uh, it's like a, yeah, I, and I played it solo and I, I played it solo in the one stop co-op. It was a disastrous loss. It was, it was bad. Uh, <laughs> Spoiler alert. So many passengers in Atlanta. I had to uncover it. It was so many. I couldn't believe it. Um, anyway, who has played this game here? That's I mean, right. I want to, from what you said, uh, I will so. be bringing it. Uh, so yeah, I yeah. am, I am bringing it. I'm uh, going to, I have been vaccinated and I've, I've, I've been given the go ahead to go visit some people. So I'm like, okay, it's going to be yep. <laughs> uh, in a couple of weeks. So we're going to play a couple of games, a little bit of space alert, a little bit of other games. Um, so yeah, once that one now boarding, if anybody likes real time. And I just think this game is super, is, is so much fun. It's just the, the, the cooperation right that's what that's what really is so like um you know like like something like pandemic rapid rapid response had that relay race effect and i feel like it's like a series of solo games and that wasn't really mm -hmm. cooperative uh and a couple of other games you know just kind of like you're, it's too frantic to really truly there this game because of the way you have to work with your part your partners to get passengers all over the place it's excellent so it's low <laughs> because no one else has played it so i'm going to keep singing nope. the praises go watch the video well, I actually yeah, I it. wanted so I'm definitely going to play it. So I Fantastic. own it. I, I love Tim Fowers. Same thing with uh, Burgle Brothers. I'm getting Burgle Brothers, too. I really liked Tim Fowers design. Walkstar is another real time one that I actually really like. If that his. was not that good. Oh, <laughs> the, se the second version. Did you try the second? Yeah, edition? I tried the third edition mm -hmm. or third edition. Oh, OK. okay. All right. Well, we really like his it first here. game. It but, wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought he uh, I thought he did better here. I really yeah. Did. And but so that's why I just haven't played it yet. So uh, makes me excited. So thank you. So uh, we're going to crawl up the list a little bit. We're going to get to one of Peter's favorites, a game that Peter rated and nobody else rated. Uh, it is, I think, a simple game, a uh, family kind of weight. Uh, number 162 overall, A Tale of Pirates. Yeah, this was our one-year anniversary episode we just talked about. This was the, uh, the one I covered there with my kids. My kids really like it. I like it a lot, too. It is real-time strategy. It's got sand timers. So you flip a sand timer over, you put it in an action. As soon as the sand timer runs out, you can do that action, which I think is harder, right? Because there are two ways of doing this. You could flip it over and then do that action. Then when the timer runs out, move it. I think it's much harder to put the sand timer there and then do the action and then also think about where you're moving the sand timer to. I think it creates a lot more stress, which is funny because this is more of a family weight slash kids game. Um, but it's got a cool 3D pirate ship. It like spins around like, I mean, it's really tactical. There's a lot of fun. There, you know, the game itself has enough going on to be fun. Like, you know, you can load cannons, you can repair your ship, you can do boarding actions, you can change the speed, you can turn the ship. So there are all these different stations to go to. And it's like you need to do, of course, four of them to like fire a cannon. Right. So like you, <laughs> like you can't do it as one thing, like even though it's the kids game, you really have to. And I say kids game, but I don't even know that it's fully a kids game. Family it's just game. It's a family more family game. weight for sure. And but there's so much going on and then it builds on itself. So it was like one of those not legacy games, but like storytelling legacy where it just gets more and more complicated. The more you go on, they add more and more stuff to it. Um, so I think it's really good. And I think it's probably something that a lot of people miss. I actually think Colin would probably love it um because he likes real-time stuff like this so yeah i don't know a complete coincidence about real-time just kind of like being well actually maybe not because real-time tends to be hit or miss so it's like if it's good it's a hit and it's you'll rate it and if it's not then <laughs> move on yeah, and i uh i like the tail pirates too uh especially with my kids um I don't think you said, Peter, but the app is really well implemented. You do need an app, but it's got like sound effects and it kind of tracks everything for you. And yeah, the uh, I, I just really like, I don't like legacy games much, but I really like games that have um, that kind of slow unlocking of like complexity, you know, and you can, 
you can start out really easy, but then like play crazy stuff by the end and like kind of gets into more of a meaty, like kind of gamer experience. So this one's fun. Hence why Magic Maze was made your list uh, pretty high. Yeah. There you go. All right. Now, uh, speaking of Michael Kelly, the next game is his, and I've never heard of this. Uh, so you're going to have to help me out here. This is 145. You rated this and nobody else. Uh, this was, um, this was, I think you're like 20 something overall in the 20s. Uh, Planet Apocalypse. Oh, Peter, you didn't, you didn't rate that I one? rated it. Yeah, yeah. P- Peter should have had it on there. But uh, yeah, Planet Apocalypse, this is... Uh... <laughs> I'll furiously check. I got to check. Go ahead. You talk. <laughs> this From, was uh... in our top 50. We don't even know it because there's no way I didn't rate it, right? Go ahead. Keep going. It's from uh, Peterson Games. Uh, This is uh, basically a tower defense game in that uh, these demons are, in the base game, you have a circular board and demons are kind of advancing around it from like where the head demon resides in hell, basically. And uh, you have heroes, you're moving around the board, but then you're also dropping off troopers that will kind of act like towers and automatically attack enemies as they come into their spaces. My big negative with this, I'll start with this, and this is the main thing that kind of brings it down for me. I think the mechanics are generally great. I think this is uh, (laughs) one of the worst uh, value to like uh, content uh, propositions I've seen in recent years. Um, Peterson Games, they did uh, Cthulhu, uh, they did uh, Cthulhu Wars, and they love giant, giant minis. And this game certainly has that. But whereas Cthulhu Wars uh, came with like four factions, this comes with a single map, Yes, you can flip it, but it's basically still the exact same scenario. Uh, like a very small number of cards, very small number of characters, a single boss, and it's over $100. And it's like, it's so little content for what you're paying, especially if you're like me and don't care much about the miniatures. But that being put out of the way, uh, the combat is fun. It's dice-based. It's random. It's goofy. Um the leveling system, I've talked about this when Peter and I reviewed it on the podcast in my review. One of my favorite leveling systems, like up there with Adventure Tactics and other things that have like amazing leveling systems. You have uh, unique abilities on your player board that you can unlock in different order and like uh, going different ways. It's kind of like a skill tree that you unlock. But then you have a general pile of level up cards. And to level up one of the things on your board, you buy one of the generic level up cards. So you have this mix of like kind of class-based, unique to your character leveling, mixed with different every game, like offer of levels. And it it kind of combines my favorite things because I like being able to kind of explore leveling up. But I also like each character to have their own personality and not just be like, do whatever the heck you want and everyone can be equal or different. Um, So yeah, I think it's a really fun game. Um, The kind of thing that I would totally recommend, go play on TTS. But if you want to buy it, you know, just be ready to put down a lot of money to get enough content to where I think it's going to be a good, like, uh, repeated play for somebody. Uh, Baron, do you like painting bigatures? I mean, you like painting big miniatures, but have you painted, like, that thing? Like the Didn't big, he paint the, the Cthulhu thing, thing for their uh, Death May I, Die I video? The Death May Die Cthulhu. You painted yeah, Death May Die Cthulhu? Uh, on Colin's playthrough. That's it's definitely that. not that big. Nothing in the game is oh, nearly no. that large. <laughs> But that was that was a blast to paint. I actually sat in my garage and painted that thing for a whole day. Like with a spray can? Did you do the the? No, the I used air, I sprayed the... it. I sprayed it with primer, but I used my airbrush for almost the entire thing, just because wow. it's so much easier. So that's yeah. awesome. It, it was pretty sweet. I had a lot of fun doing it. I kept sending zoo, uh, polos to Paul, like check this out. I'm doing this. Yes. this oh, that looks so cool. <laughs> oh, it was awesome. It was so awesome. Planet Apocalypse. Go ahead, send it to him. He's gonna paint it up. It's gonna make it look great. I don't know about that. All right. <laughs> at sometimes, at some point, we have to visit you just so I can play that because I have not obviously played that scenario, and I love Death May Die. So yeah, I definitely need to play it with a painted giant Cthulhu at this point. Yeah, it's at my house, and it's amazing, and it sits <laughs> in my game room. Although my wife doesn't like it, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, if you put it anywhere except your game room, I'm sure there would be like a revolt. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Like it becomes a centerpiece on your dinner table. <laughs> I don't think my wife would love that one. No. <laughs> As opposed to Michael Kelly, who is re- running for divorce right now, Colin actually wants to keep his family together. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> if you don't get that joke, tune in to episode yeah. 100, was, 200. 200. <laughs> I was going to say that was, a, that was a good callback. Nice job. <laughs> All right. So we are going to move to Colin this time. Uh, Colin, so I have played this game. And I think a couple of us have played this game when it was worse. Uh, this game got better. Uh, it is our 136. Are you the only one that rated this game? Yes. Uh, this was your 20th game overall, uh, 80 points. It was Fallout with an expansion that ma- apparently made it better. 
Yeah, the atomic bonds. I mean, it just it's very similar to Roombound with the Unbreakable Bonds expansion. The atomic bonds expansion actually made the game co-op actually made the game good because I will tell you, I played the base game, which it's based upon the video game. If you've ever played the video game, very similar. You're going out, you're doing different adventures. Uh, you're you're trying to complete certain objectives to win the game. Uh, the base game is actually solo or competitive, but with the atomic bonds, you can then play cooperatively. They also even add a cooperative die into the game. It's really fun. Uh, the all the scenarios have changed into cooperative scenarios then as well, so they give you all new ones for that, which was super nice. Uh, and then with the California expansion as well, you can do larger maps so you've got lots more to explore which is really the fun part about the game is exploring right <laughs> the best part about the game are the story cards and how those stories and each time you play you'll have different types of stories and you follow them through and it's really cool to see how they work uh so i i really really liked it when i played it solo uh two care uh, three characters i think i think i did three characters and i played it one time with another person really liked it uh it's very simple dice chucking adventure board game Highly recommend it, but you got to get the Atomic Bonds expansion to make it good. And I really almost recommend the California expansion as well, but then you're looking at like 150 bucks. So I'm not sure it's worth that, uh, but you can find the base game of Fallout for like 20 bucks because <laughs> yeah. it unfortunately didn't do very well. So uh, if you can get that cheap, it might be worth it. Who else played the original Fallout before the expansion? Uh, you you, you probably did. thought it sucked. I mean, I... I'm a huge Fallout fan, and I yeah. played through all of the Fallout video game, including all of the uh, the DLC expansions that the Fallout game was uh, based on. So I recognized every quest. I had investment in it. I definitely played it at least twice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was definitely a game for those times. Yeah, I, I was not impressed with... And, and the thing is, I... I, I, I like how I like how much this Atomic Bonds expansion seems to improve it, but I was not impressed with the core mechanics anyway. So I don't think I would right. love it personally, even with the new stuff. Right. I mean, it wasn't like it wasn't very threatening. You know, it, it was very like you, in a game where there it's a, it's you know post apocalypse and mutants and you know pools of irradiated acid. Like you shouldn't be able to just kind of like traipse around the board and like skip monsters and like have the monster just not activate unless a certain symbol appears. And it's like, what exactly am I doing here? Like I, I kind of get. Well, first of all, I think they rushed it. You know, I think it was just like a total like rush job. Like, okay, let's let's coordinate this with some kind of like video game release and was like get it out there. And it's like I, I just don't think that it was baked enough. So like it sounds like the atomic bonds kind of like completed, you know, mm -hmm. the, the experience made it a little bit more lethal, made it a little more you know crunchy. Uh, like you know, the base game added like these goal cards that you just like shot at you. It's like what am I doing now? Uh, that would have been nice to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just, it was a mess, but it sounds like the atomic bonds expansion really did a lot. They get rid of all the agenda cards. You no longer right, have those yeah. silly agenda cards that were right. dumb. When all of a sudden you randomly win, you'd be like, what the yes. heck is going on? <laughs> all that's gone. There's actually a way for you to win. And it's very easy to lose because you pick a faction at the beginning of the game and you have to follow that faction. Oh, that's so much so better. Whole, yeah. So then all the stories also make sense. Right. And because you're following right. that right. specific fashion, faction, then I can switch over and play the same scenario with the other yes. faction. And I have a totally different experience. So I definitely like it a lot more, but I understand the mechanics, especially with the dice rolling. I mean, you get stronger by rolling dice over and over and over and over and over, and over again, trying to get the some dumb little symbols of, <laughs> yeah. oh, I got the arms or the you head. Gotta get, or move, the, move, 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 yeah, move. Well, you know what I mean? It literally <laughs> is because that's what it is. It's like, I can be more powerful. There's not more dice. It's just literally more, I'm going to reroll again mm. and again and yeah. again, you know, so it's still, not, it's still not great, but I really enjoy it. And if you do like Fallout as a theme, I think it will sing really well. All right, so that was Fallout with the Atomic Bonds expansion. So uh, before we move on, hold on. We have some controversy. Uh-oh. I demand a recount. Planet Apocalypse was my number 32. Where? So no, where? I'm, no. I am it guessing not. that it, it would have made not. our top 50. Oh, there it is. Yes, I'm looking at my <laughs> list. Number 32. It's not here. It's not here. It's not oh, there. it's right there. It doesn't count. <laughs> no, well, no, I'm sorry, 31, because column one is the game name. So right. it's number 31 on my list. Okay, fine. I, Whatever. I demand a recount. Fine. Top 50. We'll redo an episode. <laughs> one is frozen in amber. No, <laughs> it is Han and Carbonite. It is done. I don't care. It is, Wait, this is why we do Han, best Han of the rest. Han and Carbonite was literally defrosted like 20 minutes later if you're watching them all in a row. <laughs> it, it is literally, like, this is why we do it. <laughs> there were a couple of games, actually, that I was like, ooh, what did I rate that? Ugh. 
Uh, but look, look what you did, man. You made me close out my tab. <laughs> <laughs> I hate you all. <laughs> anyway, I got it. Okay, so the next game is actually for me, and it's one above. So I, so I am the only one that rated this. Uh, the same rating as Colin, uh, 20 overall. I love this game. And I don't know if anybody here has played it, but not everybody here is a Pandemic fan. So I can see that not being, you know, a thing you seek out. It is Days of Ire, Budapest, 1956. This was from designed by David Tercy, published by uh, Mr. B Games. So it's not yeah. like if anybody knows Mr. B Games, it's not like, you know, top level production and, uh, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, so it is the theme is uh, the student uprising in Budapest, 1956. I am a history buff. I did a history episode with Liz Davidson on this show, on the on the game and the, you know, the the struggle against communism and what the students did and, you know, the, all, everything I love. And it, the, the, the historical integration was really, really well done. Uh, and it's a fun game to me. It is a pandemic ish game. Uh, where you 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 are playing some students, you're running around different spaces, and instead of diseases, you're dealing with events. So the events are, you know, and they're historically based. Like, okay, uh, you know, uh, uh, starving people here, bring them food, and you know, uh, uh, they're trying to blow up a tank here, bring them munitions. So like, you're bringing, you're picking up and delivering uh, stuff, and you're just going from point to point. What I like about this game mechanically is that it adds like card actions. So like you have your basic point to point movement, but then like the events in pandemic, they're like just like free card thing. Mm. This game really leads into it. So like you can be like, I, I moved 10 and I did it. I was like, as long as you have cards, you know, you can just like, you know, fly around the board and do your thing or you don't have cards. And you <laughs> <laughs> but if you, but if you play well, it's, it, you know, it, it gives you that pandemic -y rewarding, you know, manipulate the board and all that kind of stuff. So I adore this game. It's amazing. Um, I'm, I, I'll probably, I might just like throw a playthrough um, on, on the bus just for the heck of it uh, because I want for it. Yeah. Um, why not? Uh, so who else has played days of ire Budapest, 1956? I, I listened to your entire episode with Liz and I thought it was fascinating discussion. So I'm interested in it, but no, I haven't played it. All right, here we go. Bringing that one too. I mean, I, dude, we're not going to get to play all these games. No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> Especially since we're going to like complete the entire campaign of space alert. So that's, that's a priority. So. <laughs> well, that or we'll play uh, BattleCon the entire weekend now that I know you like that game. Uh, okay, okay, we'll play a, a couple of games. Of <laughs> <laughs> I suck at that game. It's pretty bad. Uh, all right. And meanwhile, uh, Mike played every day for an entire school semester with one of his students at lunch. No, no, that so, was Exceed. Really? That was Exceed. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Good, good luck, Jason. Have fun with that one. <laughs> All right. We're going to, so now we're going to go on to 132. Yeah. Again, a, a game that only one of us rated in the other one. And I know why. So in this one, this isn't like a, a vacuum over here. Some of us have played this game and dislike it. This is not everybody's game. But Bernd, who rated this game about 18 overall. It is folklore, the affliction. Oh, my folklore game! I like folklore. This is <laughs> here we go. Here we go. He, he loves this one. Here we okay, go. So folklore <laughs> is really good in a few ways and really bad in a few ways, which is why it's high as my list of dungeon crawlers. It is eighteen, and I don't. So that it's means eighteen. Really, that's a high. That's a high. No. Yeah, but that means seventeen other dungeon crawlers I own that are better than this. <laughs> but there are other co-op <laughs> games it's, it's, way better than this. <laughs> No, the, Go okay. ahead. So as a co-op game, it's really fun. My wife and I have just thoroughly enjoyed this one. The aspects that are great is the story that goes along with it is really cool. And the virgin paths are really neat. I also like uh, the characters and the way they can develop down different trees and stuff. I like the board as a whole where you're moving and doing city events and or not you're doing town events and off-road events. So you're kind of creating this own like story as you're playing through the stories because it's telling you to go from this point to this point but these things are happening to you and you can actually stop in towns and instead of going to this point you can go off this because when your guys died so you have to go over here and try to raise them and you're having other things happen to you and by the time you finally get back on mission you're then able to get through the mission now the problem is the map tiles aren't the greatest they're kind of just big squares punk hit the ground and then you kind of but they have some train going on and then we get to the combat <laughs> This is the whole point. It's the whole point. No, no, not the whole point. That's not the point. They're, they're, for, <laughs> at least for us, we really enjoy playing through the story of the of folklore. The combat is pretty bad. For the third edition, minus the mold, it actually has a better combat system. They actually <laughs> implemented these like uh, tiers of 
things happening in the combat so you can be moving up the chain and down the chain. The part that really was not good is they didn't implement any type of tactics into it. So at least this gives a little bit of tactical push into the way it works. There was that it was so lacking in the first one. I felt a so dungeon bad. crawler with no tactics. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, folks, you put it number 18. <laughs> well, that's an number RPG 18. in a box. <laughs> well, RPG in a box. They didn't label it as a dungeon crawler. It was an RPG in a box. So that's really what it felt like. So as we're going through the story, it's really cool. But yes, the combat's a little lacking. Miniatures I mean, are bad, cool. like like because you've also played Madara, you've also yeah. played Sleeping Gods, you've also yeah. played Tainted Grail. Like, yeah, and all those are buyers for folklore when all three of those have great combat and a great story. You know what I mean? Uh, yes, that's why they're higher. Doesn't well, mean okay. I <laughs> and also folklore is set in a different world. Folklore is a very gothic. I don't have a gothic storyline that's really cool. Yeah. This is vampires, zombies, and uh not zombies, sorry. Well, there are zombies, but vampires and werewolves and these kind of like mythological creatures. And you're in a world that's like like doom and gloom type thing as opposed to like the oh I'm bright and happy like Madara's all colors and like rainbows and stuff when it comes <laughs> to you. it's just amazing. I mean the, the cuddly teddy bears and you well, I, mean, I don't know if they're cuddly but they're just really colorful and cool where this is like all dark and like it feels like a Ravenloft if anybody's ever played like yeah. that Dungeon Dragon type story where it's really depressing and sad and all these bad things are happening in the world and you're just trying to do your best to rid what you can and bear is having so much fun. That I got to talk. Wonderful. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> it sounds like it makes people depressed when they play it. Is yeah. what I'm getting at. It makes Colin depressed. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. I wanted to say for Baron though, there are a couple cool things. And like one of the cool things too was that they had different types of combat, right? So you'd have combat where you actually were on the board with miniatures, but then you'd also have combat where you would just have a card, right? And you yep. would roll for it and they'd do something and then you could respond to it. Um, and that was kind of cool. This, they had different ways of having encounters versus combat. Uh, and the, I felt like the encounters were actually way better than the combat itself. I agree. Um, and, and definitely the story, if you like doom and gloom, it was great. Um, but it was just wasn't my type of thing. So that's why it wasn't for me. <laughs> it, it four people. And we actually came to this moment where you had to like, oh, check out this grave. This is the very first mission. So it's not even a big spoiler. But you check out this grave. And all of a sudden, my friend's like, oh, I'm totally going to check out the grave. I'm like, but the wolves are killing us, man. We need to get to this. Thing. Oh, I'm going to check out the grave. Okay, roll your die. Oh, you fell and sliced your head open on a shovel. Good work, man. Way to go. And he's like, oh, oh, never mind. You found a red gem, though. Oh, great. I found the red gem. So you get the boss. And it's like, okay, who's got the red gem? I do. Oh, okay, well, he only wants to kill you. Really? So I got my head. <laughs> awesome surprise moments that you remember from these games. So even though you're getting the best, you think you're getting the best thing. Nope, it wasn't this way. So it does kind of give a little bit of like weird things like that, which I thought was kind of fun too. But yes. I'm a huge story person, but there's a limit to like mechanical like sloppiness and it just... Ugh. Uh, anyway, <laughs> and if you want to see a playthrough with selfish people in dungeon crawls, watch our Gloomhaven playthrough and watch Jerry run to the corner of the map every week as our tank. <laughs> well, while Mike and I push forward and get slaughtered, and Jerry's like, I'll be right there, guys. He's like, Why am I spending so many turns just catching up to you guys? I'm like, You ran to the corner where there's nobody at to get a treasure chest, it's like loot, for no loot. reason. They gave you five loot. coins, it is the like, loot, yes. I, and I, at I one point, Jerry. after our last mission, he goes, isn't there anything else to buy? I don't have anything left to buy. I'm like, dude, because you're not <laughs> supposed to run around just getting money. It's not get money the game. So, yes. If, <laughs> if you want... Get money the game. <laughs> yes. If you want to see uh, fun playthroughs with uh, selfish friends, watch our Gloomhaven playthrough and watch Jerry get us killed every week. And like folklore mm -hmm. has actually been on one stop co-op shot from Colin. I did it on my channel too. And I actually did the second, the first one out of the second act. And I'm planning to the third one out, first one out of the third act coming up hopefully pretty soon too. I, so. I love, I love that uh, Colin's folklore videos are like so popular and they've been around so much because I just get to watch with joy as if you will ask Colin all these comment questions, you know, like all these year, many year old videos are like, hey, so so how much do you still love this? Do you think I should get this? And Colin like very diplomatically is like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You should go ask, meet me at the table. Exactly. <laughs> I'll tell you, Baird knows all about it. I still got it. I still play it. Uh-huh. And it's nice. all painted. So yeah. does Steve, has Steve not been on the was, list yet? I was about to say, where is no, it? I was actually just going to point it out. So the we, so Steve's, Steve's the games are going to be in the second episode for the most part. Um, wow. The games that he rated highly all missed the list. So like every <laughs> hit, like I think six of his top ten games just missed the list. So like there's a giant pile of really highly, really Steve games that are coming soon. 
Uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to you, buddy. We'll get to you. The second episode is going to be a big <laughs> shining spotlight on you. Uh, this one, uh, because like, out of for whatever reason, like this is the Jason show. So I, I have another game that is going to come up. This is number 128 overall. I rated this 86 points. And this is one of my favorite games. Uh, and nobody's played it. Um, but it's, it's for a very particular reason. So it's not, is it a game? I don't know. Uh, it is Untold Adventures Await. Uh, the Rory Story Cube storytelling game. Uh, so I, I consider it a game because like, I don't know, you just like, you're trying, there's a contest. There's some kind of contest. The contest is, can, can you make the best story? Uh, and so like in Rory Story Cubes, they're just like cubes with pictures and you roll them and you make up a story. That's great. But what Untold did was it gave you structure. So now you're rolling and there's like a five act play or like, you know, TV show or movie or whatever it is. So like you roll once and that's like the opening scene. And then you tell, you talk through the opening scene, you write it all down. And the second one is the get to know you phase. So like, you know, we're, we're talking and we're meeting these people and whatever, whatever. And the third phase is the betrayal. So like who betrays you? You're rolling another Rory's third cube. And so then you get to the, you know, the, 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 the bottom of the hero, like the hero is like greatest challenge. And then the final climax at the end. So it guides you through telling a story and it does so so that you tell this story from soup to nuts in about an hour which in a storytelling game it could be anything it could be like one hour it could be like we're just gonna keep on going here the 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 it's so tight it's so structured but the play within the structure is amazing because story story cubes are amazing i use this game in therapy i use this game to just have fun with my kids just like you know we're gonna roll and tell me you know tell me about this bumblebee and <laughs> the bumblebee, I know the bumblebee well. Whatever it is, <laughs> you can use the different sets with it. So you can use like the enchanted set, or you could use the medieval sets to tell different stories. And you know, I just I like speaking of like Baron, uh, stories you remember. Like I remember the stories that I have told. Some of them that I've told with Untold. It is an amazing game, um, a game, right? It's an it's more of an activity. The contest is how good a story, how memorable a story, how funny a story can you tell? Is that gaming mechanics? Mm -hmm. But I don't care. It's amazing. But then uh, aren't, aren't you getting into competitive if the only thing that makes it a game is that you compete to tell the best story, Jason? What are you talking about? You compete against cooperative games all the time. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, are, are it, so are you all working together to tell a story? Yeah. It's, it's, oh, okay, okay, okay. I, I didn't, I didn't but like you're, okay. you're telling the best story. Like you're challenging your. So not you're, you're challenging yourself to, to tell the best Better story. than your last story. It's a beat yeah, your score that, game, Mike. Got it, got more it. memorable. Beat your score game, more yes. Fun. yes, like an improv game. That's why right. it doesn't you, work You're trying to pop the audience. Yeah. So amazing you, you, game. You, you, you flip to the back of the uh, rule book and they've got a table and it's like, was your story 20 good? Yes. Oh, you suck at stories. <laughs> were, was were your you story 40 good? points? Were you merchant good? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, kids. We just didn't have it today. We didn't have it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was a middling uh, improv game. There you go. Untold I do like the away. cubes, though. Those cubes are awesome. I use them for RPGs. So oh, cool. I, I, I roll a bunch of them, and I, I design the scenario based upon the symbols that come up for the RPGs I'm, I'm GMing. So nice. really, really, I do recommend them. what system them. are you doing uh, within D&D &D or within like something more open-ended? The IGM uh, Star Wars RPG, it's the uh, mm -hmm. Force, uh, what's, what's it called? Uh, um, Edge of the Empire, the one that's Fancy Flight game. Oh, the Fancy Flight one, yeah, yeah. So then yeah. when you roll Bumblebee or when you roll <laughs> uh, Pixie Wand, how do you... <laughs> that's the Force, man. That's the Force. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and right. some creature came out that flies, right? So, yeah. So, yeah. All right. So we are going to get to, now we're going to get to some games with some meat. There, there are some meaty games coming up over here. Enough of the storytelling fluff. Must be Barrett. We, uh, Baird, one of Baird's games is coming up in the next little cluster, uh, but we are going to go to Mike first. Uh, it is number 85 overall, barely made the list for Peter, which kind of edged it up a little bit, but it is no, our number one, 126 game. He just got, uh, Mike just got new content for this game just a, a little while ago, uh, so lighten it all up. What game am I talking about, Mike? Cloud Spire, I assume. Cloud Spire. Yeah, so Cloud Spire, um, it's it's a game that I've been very hesitant to recommend to others. Like I have to give them a lot of caveats and be like, hey, you got to be ready for this and you got to be ready for that. Um, but this is a chip theory game. So, you know, what to expect if you know chip theory, lots of neoprene, lots of chips. <laughs> um, but it, it's kind of a mix of like a MOBA. If you don't know what that is, that's like where like you have your heroes and you're trying to like kind of go while these mobs move around, kind of mixed with tower defense. 
Um, and the reason it's low on my list is not because it's low as a game. I love Cloud Spire. It's an amazing design, at least Who's for me. Like how for you, it dude? Me. It's not that low. Oh, oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I guess I put it up higher. But yes, yeah, uh, I think co-op is, uh, it's not the weakest way to play it, but it's the toughest way to get to the table because, uh, and they even say this, uh, in the new version of the game that just came out, they like redid all the rules and all the graphic design. It's so much better. And I, I do, uh, I can recommend the game more to people now because it's not as obtuse to get into. Like they made it a much smoother experience. They have tutorials now, both a full solo tutorial mission with like directed turns and a full competitive uh, like tutorial with directed turns. Um, but yeah, the thing about co-op is, and they even say this in the rule book, you need to know the rules like basically backward and forward. So you can't just like sit down with like your family, with your gaming friends and throw a co-op game down. You really need to have like played competitive, played solo to get to know it. Um, and then also co-op is by far the biggest beast to handle because you generally have uh, both of you that having a raspberry faction. That gets the old then, uh, Shelf Stories Raspberry yes. right there, a co-op uh, um, mode. Because you have to run two of the bots. You have to run yes, two have bots to run simultaneously, at least two bots. and it is a bear. In some scenarios, you have to run three bots, so it's like five <laughs> factions on the board. So <laughs> with all that out of the way, Cloud Spire is a friggin' awesome game, if you can get over that. Uh, the faction variety is like unbelievably different. Like They feel so different. Uh, very low luck. Like you might think of it as a luck based game, like in this kind of genre, but the only die rolling are the towers and they're like very even in their distribution. Um, yeah. So incredible tactical experience, like really great puzzle for solo and co-op. If you want to like really kind of puzzle out how to win the scenarios. I, I like this one a lot. Yeah. So if too many bones wasn't complicated enough for you yeah. and obtuse <laughs> enough for you, try cloud spire like that takes it to the next level and then you got to control four factions and know them all imagine knowing four gear locks without playing them individually right because you have to like now know them as a team yeah it's basically like playing four gear locks at the same time without playing them solo first like just throwing four gear locks down on the table and trying to figure it out and then they're like oh but we're going to combine these two gear locks so half the ability from this one and half the ability from that one to make it a new gear lock that you've never seen before is also going to be part of this mission as well Peter, you're spoiling the, the later part of the list too, too, oh. You're too spoiling. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting to that one. We're getting to that. Too many spoilers. <laughs> too, wow. <laughs> well done, sir. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask Baron. Baron, uh, chip theory tends to make big, expensive campaign games. Do you not get into them because there's nothing to paint? Uh, I don't get into them because they're no fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, like I actually have never been challenged in a single one of the Too Many Bones expansions. Mm -hmm. I actually have played Too Many Bones a ton. I sold every single thing I owned. I played all the way through the campaign that they developed. I never lost a scenario and gained every scar possible. It just, wow. I never saw at any challenge wow. at all. By the time we got to the bosses, we were powered up enough where it just, boom, done. Every card we flipped to fight, it just, there wasn't, that was just my experience um, playing Too Many Bones. Um, this we is tried not to Too Many Claw. Bones, people. <laughs> I know, well, I've never played Cloud Spire because of that. Okay, got it. Because I just never really thought, too much of too many bones even though i own every single thing i just never continued into that because i thought i just it just wasn't my thing oh and there weren't miniatures yeah you're right there's no miniatures <laughs> <laughs> well, why, why do you buy it all barrington i'm kind of confused why you kept buying more of it because i was waiting for that campaign and i thought if i could get everything then once i get the whole big campaign and the 40 days of all of what's his names and all that and i got all this stuff it would open up this whole expansion of everything you could do and it still just kind of let me down gotcha oh well we'll get we will get to too many bones if they, they start top 50. <laughs> it's getting there somewhere. Uh, but the fact that the fact that it's chip theory, right? Like it's almost like you want to talk about all their games at once because like because <laughs> everything's chips and everything kind of even though Cloud Spire is its own distinct game. And I happen to really like the solo. I I really like the solo. I like the campaign. Mike is exactly yeah, yeah. right. The um the factions feel really really different. Uh, just co op was you know it's basically two solo games smushed together and yeah, it's yeah. Not, I'm okay. Uh, all right, well let's get Barrett back in here for a game that he likes. Uh, here he comes. Look at him. He's getting excited. <laughs> I'm just getting worried. There was about to attack me again. All right, let's go for it. <laughs> well, but no, I'm, Baron. I mean, you 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 understood the exact same flaws that Colin had with folklore. It's not like it was a yeah. surprise. No, <laughs> I have I have no, I have no idea what's going on with this game. Uh, I've never even heard it before. This game, but it is parents number eleven. It is no one else rated it. Uh, it is aliens. Another day in the court. 
Ah. Oh, that one's fun. That one's a lot of fun. And basically, I should hope you think so. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Cool. Oh, new alien skin that came out. It has some really cool miniatures that went along with it. Um, the aliens are tedious to put together and terrible, but the actual game itself is pretty cool. It's got a system I really haven't really experienced. So it's really neat how it ran you through the entire movie, but you were draining your resources the entire way, just like the movie. So it felt very cinematic in that way. I sadly don't have the expansions or who knows, this might've gone higher because the expansions actually bring in- What? <laughs> yeah, it brings wow. in more Marines. And we'll see, the problem is none of the other people here have played it, is the other thing. I can tell you right I now- I thought you guys played it online at one point. No, no that's a different we, version. We played this one. Yeah, we played, we yeah. played the old yeah. leading edge or whatever it is. Uh, um, that game is, uh, is, is that game is fun. <laughs> that game is that game is probably number right below it. I bet. Alien this time is war. It. Yeah, I could have just done Alien for you all of Barrett's games. <laughs> this is amazing as well. This is very also very cinematic. It brings you through the entire movie. And it's from 1986. Come on, and it's still liable and still viable. Sure, the system's a little old, but back to glorious day in the core. Uh, the <laughs> kind of cool about it is you have the, each you have Marines. It can be played. And the co-op part of it is the fact that you are controlling these Marines, and each person has the ability to also control grunts that are the Marines that aren't being controlled. This can be up to six players, or you can play it solo, but you still have to control all the players, which of course would probably not. Steve might not like that, but because <laughs> he likes to just have one guy. And each of these people have their own abilities and they actually are similar to how they would fight in the movie. Like Gorman has to keep drawing these cards which could potentially damage the squad because he's kind of an inept leader. But you have Hicks who's trying to get the right cards in his hand and but still holding back the other. So it really kind of feels like the characters are themselves in this movie. And you, the only thing I'm not a big fan of is they're not loaded like they are in the movie. In the movie, they only had certain guns, but in this one, you can equip anybody with anything you want. There's absolutely nothing stopping you from giving, you could give Hudson a smart gun, you could give Ripley a smart gun. If you don't know what a smart gun is, go watch Aliens right now. It's the greatest movie of all time. So it's <laughs> like Oprah over here. You get a smart gun and you get a smart gun. <laughs> That's about it. And so I, that part of it I wasn't a big fan of, but it, the way it's built, that I can understand why they did it because otherwise you wouldn't be able to make it through because it is actually a pretty difficult game. Um, the other flaw in the game is the rule system was a little wonky. Um, when I was doing my playthroughs, I did make quite a few errors and every time I looked at them, I'm like, really, that's how that worked? Like, cause it was like, oh, you can shoot through this but you can't see through this or you can see through this but you can't shoot through this. So I thought, why are you having all this wonkiness? But behind that, this system of these endurance cards moving from place to place and eventually they get discarded. Now these can't come back. Um, if they're in the exhaust pile, they can come back. So you're bringing your cards back and forth to be able to fire. These aliens are all coming at you. It, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Have you played it, Colin? No, I'm never, never brought it over. No, we just haven't gotten to it. He, okay. he wants to, but I keep convincing him to play other games like Sleeping Gods or Forgotten Waters. Which is fantastic as yeah. well. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, you have a, I think it was like 15 games we earned out of out of 50. That was like, oh, Bear's got to play that one. Bear's got to play that one. Wow. There's a lot of games. Well, let's put it this way: you all have to play this one. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Right. If, if well, you'll build the aliens with the tails for him, Bear, maybe. Well, well they definitely have a TTS mod, so we could we could try to throw it on the stream channel at some point. Yeah, mine don't have tails. I took them all off. Oh. That was our. <laughs> I just took off tails. So they're like the guinea, the guinea pigs important. of aliens. Yep, <laughs> like tailless creatures. <laughs> it's just nubs. It's just nubs. They stand up right in the right. That's great. All right. Uh, so that was our number one twenty four. Uh, right next to it, I believe. Uh, actually, yeah. Mike had this rated most highly. Peter also threw some points to uh, points towards it. Another crunchy game. Uh, a game that isn't quite as. You know, the, the co-op is probably the weakest again, just like Cloudspire. The co-op is probably the weakest, but it's still an excellent game, and therefore the co-op is is solid. Uh, it is Root. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Th th this is a, a sort of a different problem than Cloudspire. Uh, th they give you so little to go off of with co-op. Like, I <laughs> I wish I had the rule book with me right now. It's like a paragraph like that long. That's the entirety of the co-op rules, basically. It's like, hey, you can also play this game co-op. Good luck. You know, like that's that's all they do. Um, I think I'll write is, that as a uh, sentence on like the Zoom call. It's like, okay, uh, play three solo games together. Go. <laughs> uh, but uh, a root is one of my favorite designs of all time. Um, and uh, you know, again, I love faction variety. You'll see that a lot, like in my my top list and that kind of thing. Um, and 
you know, it's kind of like area control. It's kind of combat. There's like some adventure, depending on which faction you play. It feels very different. And the fan created solo variant, which it became the official solo, um, the better bot project is excellent. Like I, for me at least, who likes running AIs that are interesting and doesn't like kind of mind if it's a little bit crunchy to run them. I think it's really, really well done. So I love this solo. Co-op is a ton of fun too. Just the big thing is you're going to have to like kind of play it a bit to figure out what the right difficulty level is. Because if you go too far in like one way or the other, they give you all the tools to mess with it. So you can definitely like get it right. But um, it, Which it's is not- exactly what I want out of a board game. I want like yes. a, an open-ended box of tools to figure out what I'm doing for myself. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> That's, I, it, it's that sounds like so much fun, Mike. Well, and again, the, the game that, itself why... is finding the right difficulty. Like that is the game. Like you can play that co-op game all night. Just keep playing it over and over until you get the difficulty right. It's like, all right, we won. It was it was good difficulty this time. Yeah. So I mean, like that, that's why it's. I think it was number twenty five on my list for co-op, but it's like mm-hmm. in my top ten for solo, just because it's a little wonky to get it to the table right and have a good time with it. Not yeah, idea. Jason, I actually was surprised when you said this was on my list. I looked, I'm like, really? But I guess as far down as I got when it was on my list, I was like, oh, you were okay. just shooting th- games on there towards the end. I, like, I threw it a bone <laughs> at that point. All you guys were like, what's what? I, we made it to like in the 40s, and it's like, <laughs> it's like, I'm just going to throw stuff on there. Let's put it weird. this way KDM would definitely have been way above this one um, for co op for me. Fair enough. All right, so that was Root. Let's go to Colin. We uh, This is definitely not a, a throw on the list. This is Colin's number 10 game overall. Uh, no one else had this rated uh, because none of us have played it. It is way out of print. It's very hard to find. Uh, but if you like Gears of War, you will really like... Fire Team Zero. Fire Team Zero. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, I absolutely love that game. I really wish it was not a print. I'm missing one small expansion that I cannot for the life of me find. So yes, it's a pain in the butt. Uh, but yeah, Fire Team Zero, it's set in the World War II, uh, World War II time period. It's very similar to Gears of War, where your cards of your in your hand are also your life. Uh, but they do a, a few things that I think are actually better in Fire Team Zero. <clears throat> Each person has their own deck of cards. So unlike with Gears of War, you're picking from a generic deck. You actually have your own deck, so you feel unique. Your mm-hmm. cards are unique. You'll play a three-story campaign, which is awesome because it's not too long, but it does give you that campaign feel where you can level up your character. You're going to get new cards. You're going to get new abilities. I feel like three-game campaigns are like the the, the thing. Oh, like, they are the I thing. Think that's, yeah. I think that give me three games, like, you know, three game on's end or three, yes. you know, like it, it, I could do it in a night. I get my growth, yeah. and it's like um, I'm now, I don't have to like let it set on the table or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Three is the magic number. Yeah, same with thing you. with uh, with Bloodborne, the recent mm-hmm. one, you know. Yeah, and so Fire Team did this way back in twenty. I can't remember fourteen. Maybe it's when they started this. So they were thinking ahead, you know. But unfortunately, they were terrible at their uh, um, the business side, which I think <laughs> is why they failed. Right. But we won't go there. Uh, <laughs> but so in the game, what a lot of people don't like about the game is that the goal is never about defeating the enemies, and the enemies will always spawn all of them, all the time, every time. You can't stop that, and so. Your objective is actually to complete whatever the objective is in the scenario. Now, the final one's always a big boss, but the other two are not. And so what people get annoyed with the most about the game is, well, I have no benefit for killing these enemies because you don't gain anything for killing the enemies. But that's part of the fun is you have to figure Mm -hmm. out how to complete objectives while dealing with them. And there's so much cooperation because just like Gears of War, all of your cards can be played as reactions for other players. And all of those reactions are specific to your character. So if I'm the demolition guy, I've got these reaction cards of throwing bombs, which I can help you, but guess what? I can hit you with it. Uh, You know, and if I'm the, if I'm the sniper, I can help you from range two or range three, which is great. Uh, But then I can't help in close combat. And then the, the other part that I love about the game is the rule book is literally three pages. There's, it's so easy cover, add one to defense. Um, If you've got height, then you add plus one to your hits. So it's very easy to get to the table. It's very easy to teach. Uh, Taught Barrington, what, six minutes? And we started playing. Uh, so very, very simple, which I really like. But uh, I will say it's Barrett hard loved it so much that he couldn't even think of 50 games and it didn't make his list. <laughs> okay, okay. Let me explain this. <laughs> <laughs> so so Barrett didn't even make it to 100. Did not make it to no, 100. Make 100. Gave me so, 75. Well done. But good, yep. <laughs> first of all, and this wasn't one like of 18, them. And, and a game that you think is decent, I guess, you didn't even bother to put on there. So let me explain this. So I got to play this with Colin and then all of a sudden this COVID pandemic hit. So when we were thinking of these 100 games, I actually talked to him after we did this, like, 
dude, I totally forgot to put Fire Team Zero on that list. <laughs> oh, it was so much fun. Oh, did yep. I miss it? You know why I forgot it? It wasn't back here. I don't actually own it. So Colin has it. So I'm, when we're making the list, I'm thinking, oh, what's that? Other one? Okay, that one, I'm writing down all my games and putting them on there. And I totally forgot about the ones I played at Colin's house. And this was the big one. This was the big one. This one was so much fun to play. But we were even recording it together until pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We so what number would it have been, Barrett? It probably would have been easily in the top 20 because I had a really good time with that. Again, like he's saying, don't forget the dice. The dice are amazing. When you roll those and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I blanked out. Oh, and you have to play like your card to have it re-rolls and you re-roll and all of a sudden you see the triple grenade twice. You're like, yeah, there's cheering, there's hand slapping. <laughs> and cheering, and you're moving a miniatures off the board. It's so much fun. And it's it, and it is a really difficult game in itself too. It's not a pushover dungeon crawler. It's not like one where you like, think you're going to walk over every time. You can get totally tore up really fast in this game and it's really a cool system well that's because your cards are your are your life so if you decide to do a big attack you better as heck not be getting attacked back because if you do you have no cards to soak as life um and then what they do different with than gears of war is you do draw up to your hand size so it makes you feel a little bit more powerful because gears of war you can really feel oh, down yeah. in the dumps if you're only drawing one card a turn drawing yeah, up to yeah. your hand size really can help you still feel like you're powerful but then you still have those those tough choices so yeah the the game is a lot of fun, and I highly recommend it for anyone that likes hand management with great reaction abilities, great cooperation, and yet the dice, oh my gosh, we were, ha- I mean, how many times did we try and hit that boss and we failed and yet we still didn't die? I mean, no. I just couldn't believe it. You know, it was, anyways, we, we've had, I've had some of my favorite experiences playing that game. So really this this was for publishers in case the IP floats free from the original um, uh, the company that made it and they want to reprint the game. You're going to have at least two enthusiastic playthroughs <laughs> oh, on yeah. YouTube channels. Uh, so if you want to uh, rebirth this game because good luck finding it. It is not an easy game to find. So that was Fire Team Zero. That was a lot of like, you know, really crunchy, you know, um, uh, lots of stuff happening on the table. Now we're going to go to, uh, speaking of paper thin rule books that barely explain anything but that are amazing games anyway mike you put this game really high i was actually surprised by this you must have been very impressed by the story it is aftermath yes god what a bad rule book um <laughs> the worst the worst i don't <laughs> i know i'm supposed to be talking this game the, up but, all but of I... your games are like god there's this part is terrible but this other part is good <laughs> does he oh, that, like that, any that, game that's... He do you fun, purely remember? like it besides like the, like your like arkham Horror the card game do you like any game <laughs> uh, so this yeah, rule so... book was bad though i mean like like really bad they're like oh look it's a four page rule book i'm like yeah it's a four page piece of toilet paper there's literally no rules in the rule book like i, I can make a four page rule book that has no rules in them i know I, like... I don't i don't understand like I don't know if it's Jerry Hawthorne because I like his designs. I don't know if it's him and his rules running. I don't know if it's plaid hat, but I've seen them do better rule books. So they they do have a tendency to like have really short rule books, and I have no idea why. Like overly short rule books. Um, so yeah, this is like a four page rule book, and to actually explain the game, they probably needed sixteen minimum. It's a um, campaign game. With, it's one of those yeah. storybook games. A lot yeah. going on. A separate phase with like, you know, building your little dungeon, your, uh, not dungeon, yeah. but like so your settlement. Your encampment or whatever. Yeah, settlement. Right. And there's a lot, there's a decent amount going on. It's probably the best uh, storybook game, but it's, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, so but I was going to say it? like, I, I like Mice and Mystics okay. I like Stuff Fables okay. I didn't really like Coma Knots. I find Aftermath by far the best out of those four um the storybook thing like uh like jaws of a lion where you like play in the book that's always great um i thought the theme was really clever the writing was fun the miniatures were excellent they came pre-washed i haven't seen that very often but they look like really nice because of that um and like the card management and gameplay i thought was great and they took away a lot of the uh like stuff fables i enjoyed a lot about that game but you could be totally screwed if you didn't get the right dice they did really cool things with like the cards and like how you could chain together the same number or the same color. And you had like these wilds that would be used for like your special powers. Uh, the scenario variety was great. And like your little animals, you'd, like you'd be climbing through a vending machine, trying to like get some item you needed inside of it. And like you'd actually be moving through the vending machine. So if you can get past the rules, it's a really, really cool campaign game. Uh, and not super long. Like I think you finish it in maybe like 15 sessions max. Um, but yeah, those rules, man. I mean, 
I, it's hard to recommend. Like, I, I don't even know if I, I would have to go back and watch my own playthrough to play the game because I know I wouldn't be able to like look at the rule book and play it. You know what I mean? Like, I, ah, so frustrating. It's a really good game. No, I, I like, I like all the storybook games. I like Komonauts way better than you. I loved Komonauts. Oh, I thought I it really was like, terrible. I, really like I thought it was a joke. It was awesome. I like you. you I think you're a joke. <laughs> oh, oh, here it comes. Here the break up of OSCS live. <laughs> but I do agree on Aftermath. It's a very good game. Uh, all right. So, uh, Steve, we, we took the blanket off of Steve. We, he, we're ready to unleash him. And he's here too. <laughs> these six games, well, uh, his six games are, are all games he's super passionate about. So, I'm like, uh, it's basically like the bear defect where it's like you just shut him down and then wait and then. He's ready to go. So I know you like this game. And this is the this is the sixth game. The you nobody else rated this game. That's why it is this in this position. It is 119. There is a Kickstarter for it live as we are recording this show. It may even be live as we are um, you know, as we release the episode. So uh what game am I talking about, Steve? Most likely V Commandos. Most likely V Commandos. There's a passionate group of fans for that game. Oh my gosh. Like our, our stream yes. channel, like every video that comes out for that is like our hottest videos. I don't know what's going on, but people love the <laughs> commandos, man. It's it's a great design. I love the game. It is, in my opinion, is the best stealth game I played. And I I like playing stealth games for sure. Of the 75,000 so, stealth games there are in board gaming. No, there's not. <laughs> there's, 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 there's not that many. There's no, many. there's like, there's maybe... There's probably like a dozen or so of stealth games, so not there's not that many, but this one is is my favorite of the bunch, and so basically it is uh, World War II. It's based on history, but it is not historical in that nature. It has you know it takes stories of real historical events and those in the game as events, but basically it is more like a video game or cinematic experience, and that's why I love this game so much because as I'm playing this game, I just I get engrossed in what's happening. I get engrossed with the, the, the sentiment of it. Like, oh, yeah, I'm going to plant this, this TNT over here, go set this trap over here, and detonate it off. And uh, it does a lot of things really well. It, it, the map is a really unique design in the sense that like, it takes no time to set up a map. Mm. Um, and getting back to our previous comment, talk about like campaign games, like having three game campaign games. Well, guess what? This one is one of those. Like most of the campaigns are are multiple levels. Sometimes you do multiple levels at the same time. But uh, it is it is excellent it, it, that the map is so quick to set up. So it only takes like ninety minutes or maybe two hours to play a full campaign. You can easily do it in a night. Another and if I want to play a quick like game, three. Well, depending on the mission, right? There's like you know two and three and four. But like I like the three mission. Like you know, you're in you uh, you know you go to the tower and you scout the place, and then you go to set the TNT, and then you go over there yep. to watch the TNT blow up, and it's like boom, 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 done. Exactly, exactly, for sure. And the the thing that makes the thing shine for stealth games is that you're able to save an action, which a lot of games save actions, not a big deal there. But you can use your saved action um, basically any time, and you can do a zero cost action basically any time. Uh, so you can set up these tactical situations where like, oh yeah, the enemy's moving. It's no but no player's turn. So the enemy's kind of turn. After they're done with the turn, you can blow that team team, took out a, a bunch of guys. And it's just so fun to have these situations set up and just see what happens. And scenarios are great. Like all the scenarios are very different from each other. Like, yeah, you're blowing something up or like interacting with an objective, but how the map is designed and how you get through that is very different. I just did a stream uh the, the night before this, where we were riding a cable car up and down the, this place and had to time it to jump on the cable car to get to the other side. So that was um that was pretty fun. So you can see how badly we failed on it, but we tried it twice. So <laughs> so I my favorite is it's like it's a stealth game where you're like blowing up half the base. It's like that's stealth like commando is stealth, right? He just comes oh, yeah. in <laughs> like Conan the stealth or... <laughs> is to get to the objective and then once the objective happens, then you do a thing. So like yeah. you got to get there, <laughs> but exactly. it isn't the whole stealth the whole time. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Nor does it pretend to be. Uh, I, my, my biggest difficulty was that it's the stealth is a little bit too easy. Like it's a die roll, you know, you can go mm -hmm. into an area and it's like, okay, you know, on a, what, I forget what it is, lower high that you could, that you get discovered, but it's like, I do awesome tactics. I map out the, you know, the, where, they're, where they're going or whatever it is. And I know exactly what I'm going to do. And then... <laughs> Not a fan. <laughs> like, when it comes to stealth games in particular, so like, you know, your, your Deus Ex and your Metal Gears and like, I want to be able to 
take all that time to watch the enemy padding and then have that satisfying moment where I like come up from behind him and choke him out and, ch- and drag him behind the pot of plant or whatever it is. And <laughs> I can't drag him behind anybody behind the pot of plant and V commandos because I have to roll a freaking six or whatever it is. I'm not, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, they have a, uh, the campaign that's going on right now, they added more mitigation, a lot more you can do around the stealth, which is awesome. Yeah. Cause that was, that was my negative for the game too, where I like, I don't like the stuff coming down to roll. I understand how it works, but I want a little more mitigation in the game. Right, right. And they definitely added it because you level up and you get these abilities that can help uh, modify those die rolls for sure. But yeah, honestly, the cell checks is like the last thing you want to do. Like the fun part about the game is when there's explosions in the distance and then you can just like go explode everything and like mow people down and the explosions stop and then like people are dead and they, don't, they didn't hear you, right? Because you took advantage of the situation at the time. Like right. those moments happen in this game. It's really, really fun. All right, very cool. V Commandos uh, on Kickstarter right now as we, as we record this and hopefully as we post. Uh, all right, so we are going to bring in uh, Baird again. Uh, so we have a lot of Con- we have a lot of Colin and Peter in the next episode. And then yeah, I was about Steve. to say, I, I've done a tale of pirates this weekend. That's yeah. not... Oh, you're, ne- you're after this one. You're after this one. So we are going to get to... Um, everybody's going to get their six. Don't worry about it. Uh, so we're going to go back to Baird. Uh, this one, this is a super high game. Number six overall. Nobody else rated it. This game is a to me a, a glorious disaster. Um, <laughs> Why are all my games glorious disasters? No, 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 this game in particular is a glorious disaster. I, <laughs> it, this game sounds like such a good idea, but then you actually sit there and it's like, how long? <laughs> It is a pretty old design. I guess that's part of why it's like it's a little bit older design. Shadows of Brimstone. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, oh really? Oh, really? I'm I not doing it again. I'm not doing I, I've, it. I've never been bored in Shadows of Brimstone. I have other problems with Shadows of Brimstone. So, but anyway, well, go no, ahead. I'm there. not bored. I'm like, what's happening? What is, what did my die do now? <laughs> exactly. It's kind of, you know, it, they, I don't, uh, okay, for those who don't know what Shadow of Brimstone is, I, I don't know where you've been, but they've done like two major big Kickstarters, they're not a third. The first one, I didn't even back because I didn't like the theme. The theme was Wild West type Cthulhu y things. Wasn't my deal. I picked up the Forbidden Fortress and uh, people, I, I, I'm not uh, basing this on what everybody says, but I've heard rumblings, of course, that Forbidden Fortress was a better design. It was a better, like the models were better the boards were better the, a lot of the layout was better um i i enjoy it it's just really your typical fun dungeon crawler you get your friends together you all got a character you go through um i've also heard that this is probably the most house ruled dungeon crawler of all time yes um including oh, yeah. somebody's even created this whole hex crawl campaign for it mm-hmm. which is out of control i haven't played that i'm probably not going to play it because there's just there's just so much of it um but I've I've enjoyed just building up characters, having a lot of fun, um, rolling the dice and beating up the monsters. I don't know. I had Colin over. We had a good time with it. It was it was it was good fun. We I mean, yes, you are living and dying by dice rolls in this game. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And dying is something that can happen. But your guys and they don't fully die they could mutate there's like they get these bonuses you can you know there's a obviously a few flaws in this system <laughs> <laughs> calling for movement but i can they do actually say if you don't want to that, just take a four every time and you can actually enjoy yourself that way and if you house rule the way you want to you're gonna have a great time i actually really play it out of box and i have a great time playing it with the people i play it with i uh, we've always had a really good experience um, we've really never had a negative experience. Um, it's almost, we, we have a lot of fun just laughing at all the things that happen to us a lot of time. Maybe that's what I love so much about games. I'm a big fan of laughing at my own misery that happens in gaming. Maybe yeah, that's, that, that, that's that why you right. like KDM. Cause there's a lot of that. I was doing, a, I've been doing a lot of that the last couple of days. Yes. <laughs> so I don't Let know. Me ask you, this. Have you played this one, Steve? I have not played this one. I like the Wild West theme, so I kind of want to try it out. But um, no, I I haven't played it yet. But Jason, you have played it, right? <laughs> that's a, that's a disgusted yes for those of you on the podcast. If you see I, the I face, it too. and that, well, that's too. what I'm saying. That, that that's the interesting part about this. This is the first game that I can think of that a lot of us have played, but only one person is rated. So that tells you, I guess. I mean, I, I know why. <laughs> <laughs> this game fell flat for me. In, in believe it or not, the part that a lot of people love about it is like the between the mission stuff I hear, going to oh, town, that gosh. stuff. That's where it fell flat for me. Like, I just, I didn't want to do that part. 
which is funny because for KDM, I really had fun with that part. So I don't know why. Um, well, KDM has yeah. so much more to do. And it, like they get, you get lots and lots of options. And like Shadows Brimstone was like, okay, here you go. It, it's, it's, they it, it felt obvious, like what to do. It's like, okay, I, I died last time. So I'm going to like bump up my health and not know what's going to happen. It's like, I, doesn't well, Forbidden well, Fortress fix, fix that though a bit, Baron? Because, yeah. Bit. There's, there's a lot more to do in the town and they even are expanding. And I know the, the wild West got a whole town expansion, like a huge, like exp- basically it's its own book now. And I know forbidden fortress getting one too. Let's see again. I'm not able to compare forbidden fortress to probably, did you guys only play the wild West one? Nobody- no, no, we only play forbidden fortress. We all played forbidden fortress. No, I played both. Oh, you did. Peter. Okay. Yeah. Cause I haven't played the other one. So I wouldn't know. So I, if forbidden fortress wasn't your bag, it wasn't in your bag. Then <laughs> I don't know. I, I really, I really liked it. I going back to town. Yeah. There's not much to do, but I'm not really thinking the town is something that is super awesome. I'm not planning to go back there and like build a settlement and create like all these awesome things. No, I'm going to go back there, maybe get a weapon or two and I'm going back out and doing my next mission and have a blast going through the dungeon and figuring out what we fight, seeing all the cool things that appear in front of us and, play through the adventure i, I really i, I the, it, maybe it's also not a cohesive campaign that people don't like i don't right. mind either i don't mind making my own like oh i think i'm gonna i'm making my own thing up okay we got some dark stone we brought it back and they said hey you know what we're having problems with this with this other place there's some evil going on there oh well we'll go we'll go search the whole thing for it so we searched the whole thing oh we found this gate well we got to close the gate so your third mission close the gate i'll make that our third mission because that's one of the missions in the book so you can kind of just pick and choose what you want i think and you can raise the difficulty to whatever you want there's no standard of what you're doing is based on what your level is or even how hard you want to make the game you, you it's really almost a sandbox in even the dungeon of what you want to do um, very I, much yeah i do think that sadly the style of flipping over a card and figuring out what is next in the dungeon is not the greatest anymore because even though it looks like you're going through an entire fortress you're really just walking in a linear path yeah, I mean, it, no matter how many illusions they try to throw in front of you, it really is just a linear path. Because oh, this Magician's one's barred off, and this one's not. Oh, I'll go. These two are not barred off. Oh, I could go either way here. Well, yeah, but then you go this way, you're never going to come back here. And I mean, it's right. yeah. I, I will say this is a love it or hate it game. I definitely have friends that love this game to death, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, you have to play this. It's the best game ever." And I played it uh, quite a few times. It's just it's not for me. So I think there are definitely people out there that are going to love it. And um, I don't know why it's so funny because there's a lot of one dice of rolling. One people of whom are on this chat, and then five other of us are like, "Okay, we're good." Uh, <laughs> well, I don't want to. I don't want to destroy Baron's hopes and dreams. Well, Baron, I'm with you with KDM. I'm with you with KDM. <laughs> Did you see I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep going back to that. You know, and the dice rolling really brings me back almost to Warhammer type concepts, where you're rolling to hit, then you're rolling to wound, then they're rolling their armor, and they're rolling. That's like there is a lot of dice rolling, and at the end, you're finally like, "Yeah, I did one damage." Really? Yeah. Right. Like you're, no. you're, you're really you're really se- selling this game well, Baron. This game I'm really feeling that's it. kind of fun. I really like the fact that you're like try your best to do this, and something just totally fails on you, or else you can fire this fireball and it just blows up an entire room. It's amazing. I don't well, know, like. I just have to say that <clears throat> from playing it solo on my own because I got the Wild West one and then sold mm. it immediately after I put all those dang minis together, which I hated, by the way. <laughs> uh, then I played Forbidden Fortress with Baron, so I think everyone should just play with Baron because then you will have a yeah. blast. Because I had <laughs> way more fun playing with Baron than I did playing the Wild West one. Just right. calling that out there. All right, so that was um, Shadows of Brimstone, a Forbidden Fortress, uh, specifying that one. Uh, let's speed through a little bit. We're starting to slow down a little right. bit. Uh, let's pick up the pace just a little bit, just in time for Peter. <laughs> let's just mention yours in two seconds and then go on. I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, one of 17 escape room games that you put on your list. Uh, and this one is, to me, the most nondescript of them all. I, I, this, I don't even remember playing this one. But you could tell me why Deckscape, our number 17 game overall, made your list so highly at number 15. I mean, well, first of all, you're right. I love all the escape room games. I guess not all of them. There, there are three main ones that I like. Unlock, Exit, and Deckscape. And the thing that Deckscape has that stood out to me the most is that it's a one-flip game. You know how escape room games, you get like frustrated, like you can't figure out a puzzle and you're working on it for like 20 minutes and like they get to those moments of frustration. You know, not all of them, obviously, but you can hit that wall. You never get that with Deckscape. With Deckscape, you try to solve the puzzle and then you flip the card over and you're either right or you're wrong. You're wrong, you get next and you move on to the next thing. And so that really uh, is appealing to me playing, especially with kids or people who aren't as good at solving puzzles. Uh, You know, it's just 
and it still gives me that same fun. And it kind of explains how they got there on the back of the card. So I can pause the timer, whatever else, go back and figure out if I want to what happened there. And I usually do. Um, I don't know. It's just real fun. It's quick for me. It's the one that plays it the, the best at higher player counts. So if I want to play three or yeah, more, because important. the, the deck usually breaks out into three different sections. So you can even each work on your own section for part of it a lot of the time. So I don't know. It's just a deck of cards. It doesn't use an app like an un uh, unlock. It doesn't have all these cut up stuff, things like uh, like exit does. That Colin it, loves. Colin loves to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but what it does really well, it actually really does spatial puzzles well with the cards themselves. There's a lot of like not looking for hidden numbers in there, but it's like, did you notice there was a light on in this room off to the side? And that's going to give you things. Or if the light shines on the prism this way, where is the light coming from? It really does a lot of like spatial visual puzzles really well. And so for me, Deckscape is fun. I'm never going to not get one when they come out. Um, same with Exit, same with Unlock. You know, for me, all those escape room games are fun. It's just fun to do puzzles. You sold me on higher player count. So like Exit Unlock, those are low player count games. So the, but I, I, I was not impressed by Deathscape. I didn't even make that impression. It was like, okay, flip cards, flip cards. But like the, the, the more social aspect of it, I can, I can definitely get into that. All right. So that was our number 117 Deathscape. Uh, now we're going to get to a me special. Uh, Steve, you backed me up on this just a little bit. I know Mike does not like this game. And, and, and uh, Peter did not like this game either. Uh, but I don't care. It's, it's, I love it. It's really fun. Uh, this was my number 16 game overall, Brook City. Uh, Brook City is uh, Sadler Brothers Design, MDS Design, their second game after Street Masters. And it, in theory, you know, right, you, Street Masters does what it does and people like it and everything. And then the second game is going to be even better. Ooh, okay. <laughs> 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 I love it. A, the theme. I don't have a cop action game in my life. Right. And you uh, still so don't like having, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear you. What'd you say? It said, and you still don't, there's no action. It is the slowest action game ever. You, you, are, you are technically a cop. <laughs> theoretically, you are technically solving crimes in some sense. Maybe. I have had so many good times in this game. Speaking of like random things that happened, I remember all the stories and stuff. So you can, Get out of here. Uh, going into the, <laughs> going into the yacht and you know like you know, diving into the river and coming out and you know uh, arresting the person. Oh man, I love it. So the theme, you know, the, the you know Tango and Cash and the Lord of for you, like all the different like tropes. They're all in there. The theme is, is wonderfully realized. Uh, what I like mechanically is that it's a amazing movement puzzle. So there is a lot of movement in this game, like because of the cars and because like you get different cars and you need some are faster, some are slower. Then you might, you might ride the moped into the building or you might ride. And basically it's like, you know, every single turn you're presented with something you present with, it's a huge board. Right. And there's stuff all over the place. So unlike, so like in an altar quest has a huge board, but you're kind of localized in the, in the rooms in Brook city, you have to be everywhere. Like you, like this thing is happening way over there because the the token landed and you need to be over there. So it's like you got to figure out how to cover thirty five spaces worth of territory in a turn. And you chances are you can do it because of some resource you have, because of something you pulled, because of a card that you played. And when you figure that, when you puzzle those movement out, and I love movement puzzles. Um, I like pandemics, so that's why that's basically a movement puzzle. Wow, I, I have so many like pop moments in this game. Now, having said that, having said that, this game has a massive flaw. So I'm gonna go, I, um, I'm gonna go to my, actually both, I, I think both of you have observed this and I've observed it too, but what is the massive flaw in the design of this game? The length. For me, I was gonna say lack of soul. I think is what I was gonna say. Yeah, like, uh, I, 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 it's fun. <laughs> more, I, like, I did that on purpose. I, or I did not accident. There's more. Well, I was thinking like the there's an event deck and then there's a, a, a like a, a villain deck and they don't interact. Like they oh, just kind of like you well, know like you know you're trying to um <laughs> like you know one like the the uh, the scenario deck is like. Uh, you know, you have to rescue a kidnapped person. And then the villain deck is like, there's a villain and he's giving away like, you know, tapes or something like that, like the card um, uh, copyright tape. So it's like, why couldn't the villain have taken the the girl? <laughs> Isn't that make the whole sense? And they should, those decks should talk and they don't. And that's so, and, and that actually goes to what Steve's criticism is. It can lack a little bit of a soul because things are just kind of happening randomly. Right, right. And for me, it was just too long. I, I like the first hour of it, hour and a half. I could I, I could have played that game if it ended in an hour and a half. 
The problem was three hours later, I'm like, oh man, I still got like two things to do. Like, forget this, <laughs> like, you know, I, th that was the hardest part for me is it just didn't end when I wanted it to. I only play this solo. I only play, I, I, I may play it two players if I really like the person, <laughs> but I will not, I, I will, this is a solo game to me. I'm glad it made your top co-op list then. Oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not a solo list, Jason. Not a solo list. If I like the person, <laughs> I'm perfectly happy to play. <laughs> it's not um, Cloudspire where it's like solo games mashed together. It's still a perfectly good two-player cooperative game. But I prefer this game solo. It's amazing. I, the, the theme's amazing. The moving puzzle amazing. I have all the stuff for it. I have all the cops and all the all the minis and everything. It's a, it's a beautiful game. Thank you very much, Steve, for, for throwing some points my way on, on Brook City. <laughs> but yes, I realize it is it is a definitely a for me type of game. Uh, but let's bring Mike back in. And Mike, we're not going to, well, this is your last one for a little while. You're not going to hear from you for a little while. So we're going to, so uh, store yourself up and uh, tell us about, and I know you like this game. Uh, so I think you'll uh, give us the, the enthusiasm. This was your, this was number 102 overall. You ranked this around like in your 30s. It is Assault on Doom Rock. Yes. So uh, they are doing a new edition of this and I'm supposed to be doing coverage of it for the channel um, whenever they're ready to send me the prototype. So this is a, uh, Assault on Doom Rock is a tactical combat game mainly, uh, dice driven, like kind of a mix of dice and ability cards in that you'll roll some dice in your turn and you have these cards spread out in front of you and you can use the, uh, like, oh, I think I broke up for a second, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you can like, you know, put a two here to do a range attack and then put a four here to do a screen that gives everyone around you defense. And then you can use this die to move and this die to do mitigation. So if you like dice placement, I think this one might uh, hit for you. But uh, some really uh, like amazing, unique design decisions. I still haven't seen some of this stuff. Um, there is no board. Instead, everything is just relative distance. You're either in a group with a monster or you're at range. And uh, all of the cards play into that and all of the monster AI plays into that. They've got this huge bevy of monster encounters and each one has a fully unique AI deck. That's like super cool. Um, I think this game is awesome. I'm so excited for the definitive, the, uh, the new edition, the definitive edition, maybe. The uh, if... new edition? <laughs> Here's the one thing, though. I'm very excited if, big caveat to this game, they can uh, shorten it. <laughs> because, yes. um, like, you, you could just r throw some characters together and, like, house rule it and just jump into a battle, and I think that'd be fine. But they added, like, this adventure mode that has, like, this weird, goofy humor, and I don't really care that much about it. It's just kind of an excuse for me to level up my characters. But between that and this is another one with, like, three campaign games kind of put together... But like each battle can be like an hour by itself. And then like you got this adventure mode that's like an hour by itself and you usually die early enough. So it's not more than two hours, but right. if you survive, <laughs> it's like four or five hours. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so I love the, uh, the combat system. I just hope that e even if the new edition is just like, hey, here's a way to just do combat. Like that's all I would need. Like it, it, they can keep it a six hour game, but tell me how to play a level three awesome dragon. Like tell me what the correct way to level my character up is to have a chance against him. Then I would love it. But yeah, as it is, uh, I can't fully recommend it. Hopefully this new edition will fix the problems, but the actual core gameplay, excellent. I do yeah, the only other thing, the only other thing I'd want is a little bit more mitigation too. Cause yeah. if, if you don't roll well, like you're just not going to be able to do anything. There's nothing you can do about it. I, I, I mean, I would even be okay if it's use two dice to go to any space you want, right? You know, because you know you're rolling five or six dice, so you think you'd roll the numbers you need, but a lot of times I feel like I don't ever roll what I need. So um, yeah, and there's just no way to mitigate it. I think you get three rolls Yahtzee style, but still, by the end of it, you know, you you had to have. I, I don't know. It just has to work out <laughs> for you to use all those dice or even like three quarters of the dice. All right, so that was Assault on Doom Rock. Our last game that we're going to be talking about, uh, we're cracking into our top 100. So this is what we're going to uh, round the episode out here. And we're going to bring in Barrett. Uh, Colin also threw some points over here. So uh, definitely floated up a little bit too. Um, I, this game is a, fa talking about a, um, a, a glorious disaster. This game is probably the most glorious of the disasters uh, amongst the solo players and amongst people who are into adventures. Um, especially with especially that rule book Ooh. well that must mean i put it at number one then right because it's glorious. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it's a glorious it was close path. to it was it was very close it was your nine actually oh good uh so it is myth 
Oh, <laughs> yes. Myth. Oh, glorious myth that I have so much. I have everything for this game. This game is so much fun. The, I think one of the problems that people have, yes, the rule book is atrocious. It, it, was a, it, it doesn't even work. It's worse than your aftermath one. It, it's probably, you know what? <laughs> Peter could write a rule book on toilet paper better than this easily. <laughs> But this, the game itself and the core concept of this game was really cool. It was really well thought out. And it was, I mean, it was about the time, I mean, it was a long time when this game came out. So the, some of the stuff I don't think was really in play. The characters each had their own deck of cards that would be their actions and what they would do in, in, in the game. And as they go through all these different missions and quests, they would be able to level this deck up, being able to put in better cards that could do stuff. The, each of these things in the deck actually are triggering the darkness so if you're not if you play smaller things you're not moving this darkness meter up but as this darkness meter gets to a point it's going to activate so it's super cooperative in the point that you're trying to figure out your best way to try to handle all the monsters or objectives on this board while you're trying not to trigger this darkness as, as much as you can because they're going to or else getting into a position where once it triggers you're able to try to handle what's about to happen and it's it was a really neat design as to how this all works together the rule book is terrible the quests had no sense what whatsoever they made no yeah. sense at all it i felt so bad that this had such bad backing behind it like it was written so poorly it was totally a kickstarter game it was totally a kickstarter game but i own everything it's all right back here in like two tubs of stuff including i have like every deck in like its own like thing like this except built for decks so every character if you want to play a character boom it's there ready to go all of it's painted every single thing and it's a huge amount of miniatures um it, but it is it was then sold to ulysses spiel who is now putting it back on kickstarter pretty soon and they actually just put nice. a play of this um and they actually did a Kickstarter 1.5 of this, which actually did another rule book for it. They actually got the paper components uh, and a uh, miracle because this company went bankrupt. So it's a miracle they got this these paper components to everybody. And now I have actually the modules that instead of just like, oh, you flip over a card and do a quest, it's like that doesn't tie to anything. There's no reason to be going on these quests. So they actually have full missions that are upgrading your characters and things. They've added a whole bunch of new characters. But Coming back to what this game is, it's really fun if you can actually get into it. And I think playing, being a role-playing game person, I didn't mind like, oh, my guy's poison. What's poison do? I don't know. It's not in the rule book. Let's just say <laughs> that's fine. Okay, cool. I mean, we'll just go with it. That sounds fine. And so it didn't matter to the, us when we were playing it. We had so much fun. The four of us were gathered around this table every like Saturday night playing myth. And I was kind of almost creating a campaign for us inside this game because it really wasn't built to do it when it first came out of course now it is you've got tons of tons of missions are amazing i've looked through them i've even played one on my channel actually that's what started my channel was myth because a member of one stop co-op shop wasn't sure if he was ever going to get to it yeah, that guy. Right <laughs> the I president thought, and CEO well, of One Stop Co-op Shop. I mean, I this is what I found out. He lived 15 minutes from my house. And he, because somebody said like, oh, why is it myth on your dungeon crawler list? And he's like, oh, I just really haven't played enough of it. I don't know if, I'm gonna, oh, you should do a playthrough. Well, I have it, but I don't know if I'm going to do it. And, and I he met, emailed him, never reached out to a human in my life on YouTube, emailed him, <laughs> finding out he's in Plymouth and go, I got a fully painted set of myth if you want to borrow it. Nah, that's okay, man. I don't think I need it. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, I'm like, you why creep. I? Leave me alone, you weird creep. person was messaging me. What would you do? I want to come to your house with a painted set of minis. No, no, I'm good. I'm, I, I'm I, totally I, good, man. I'm totally I, good. I, I totally I'll be the guy, I'll be the guy, like, the guy with the backwards cap and an unmarked van right. in the corner. <laughs> I totally get it from his perspective, but also I, still, I thought about this for like a week or two. Like, should I reach out to him and tell him I've got this game he could borrow if he wants to? I told him. <laughs> Oh, is that weird, Robin? She's like, I don't know, it might be a little oh weird, God. but you can do it if you want. And so <laughs> finally, I did, and he said no. And I was like, Well, I'm going to record it. I'm going to do my own thing. So I just started my channel. And Myth was the first game I did, and that's really what got my channel going. Was that game? And I still play it. I still like this game. Um, I'm hopefully going to bring it out for Colin someday and show him how to play it for real because it's a good fun. I've always been waiting for Mike to play it because it's been sitting on his shelf. Finally, I noticed it wasn't in shelf storage. He goes, "No, no, it's down on the floor. I still got it." I'm like, "Good, yeah, hey, it's it's still here. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm totally gonna play it, man. It's, it's definitely." Eventually definitely happening when vanessa finally succumbs and just completely leaves this man it will be time to <laughs> <laughs> i think i realize why 
Barrett likes like Shadows of Brimstone and, and games like Myth that that the rest of us maybe don't as much because Barrett can create his own story and put those things together. And Barrett he doesn't mind if it's games. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't well, mind if it's not a campaign or if it's not fully formed. Like he he doesn't mind doing that work. Whereas for me, it's got to be in the rule book. And for me, there's got to be some kind of story there. I don't want a huge story. Gloomhaven was a little, actually, maybe I do. Cause Gloomhaven even was a little disjointed for me. And that's why I like Jaws of Lion a million times better. There's like mini campaigns, even within this short 25 mission thing, I can follow that story, right? I know what's going on. And uh, for me, I, I think that's more important. Okay. Well, it, it, I play a ton of RPGs, just like Steve. I run RPG games. Like I've been RPG in for decades. Whenever, and no offense, Baron, this is not about you. I hear this all the time. But whenever somebody's like, "Oh, just like RPGs," you know, you just make up the rules. I'm like, "No, you don't." I have never <laughs> an RPG that didn't tell me how poison works. You know what I mean? Like if it has a poison mechanic, they tell you how poison works. I so I, I get offended by these games as a designer. I'm like, "Shut up, myth." You had a job to do and you failed at your job. And if I did that, I would be embarrassed to even show my game to a single person. Do your job, designer. You know what I mean? Do your job, <laughs> publisher. Check in that your designer actually made a freaking game. You know, like I, I, I hate the explanation. And again, it's not about you, Baron. This is a frequently used like trope. I hate the explanation that, oh, you can make it up yourself. I, I have role playing games, Rory's Story Cubes. That is that says right at the outset you are making your own story. You know, or something like Fate as a role playing system. That says right at the outset there aren't that many rules. You're gonna have to fill it in. But that is not the case with something like Myth. They didn't present this as a game where like you have to make up your own missions and make up your own campaign. They're like, here's an adventure game. I want it to be an adventure game that actually functions. So I just really get mad, like as a designer, at other designers when they do this crap. It's like, what are you doing, man? Like. Either make it a, if you want it to be an Oprah world, build your own thing, that's cool. If you want it to be a sandbox, that's cool. At least provide like the minimum tools for that to actually function in a meaningful way. Well, you know as well as I do, that's a Kickstarter thing. They hadn't designed the game when they sold it on Kickstarter. They wanted to get it out. They threw together some stuff without playtesting it and sent it out. And we see it to this day. There are Kickstarters and Kickstarters that do well that have not finished designing the game. And look, Gloomhaven wasn't designed when they sent that out. But I think as good as that game is, I think it could have been better if it was fully designed when it was when it was on Kickstarter, because then they would have had a fully formed story and things. Some of the things, you know, the missions being samey, that, that's a process of like rushing something out the door, right? So, I mean, I think this is more of a problem than we, you know, even know about, right? Yeah, I think I this happens <laughs> quite often. I'm sorry. Yeah. I know we're going long. I, I, I'm sorry to rant. We, we should probably get to <laughs> the next episode. So yeah, Myth is a really fun game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, will, I will say, coming back to it, I will say that their concept of how they ran the characters, the whole deck idea, and the way that the darkness worked against and yeah, for yeah. you, and being able to cooperate through that, I thought was a really good mechanic. Yes, they didn't really have probably a good enough structure to put that on top of, and I think that, like Marcus said, that is where it kind of fell flat in a lot of people and many, many people it fell flat like that. But in their 1.5, when they did re-kick it, I guess you could say, um, they did actually <laughs> fix the rule book. It came back in a way that now is fully playable. But of course, it's just like every other game. You missed your mark the first time. You lost your people. You lost yeah. the... I mean, it, it really was a hard hit for them. And it shows because for, they really... It went downhill from them from there. I mean, they did Dark Frontiers. I mean... Colin, I know, played that game and didn't get any of the stuff he wanted from it that he nope. backed nope. because nope. they just lost the money to fund all this stuff. Like I said, I was really happy to get the paper components. And in theory, I'm getting the miniatures. They still tell me I'm getting them from the wow. second Kickstarter from like eight years ago. <laughs> all, right, then. all right. Last tangent of the episode, I promise. I just remember Mike accepted this one game that he was going to do a review for on the channel. I can't, I'm not even going to say the name of the game, but it's like, I looked on the Kickstarter page and like the first thing that flashed up was now playable rules. I'm like, Oh my God. I was like, this is going to be a total disaster. And Mike's like, Mike's like, what, what's wrong? He's like, look at all these cool miniatures. I'm like, Mike, when they're at the first thing they advertise is now playable. Like it's no good. It's not. Hey, hey good. Peter, Peter <laughs> jokes on you. Cause I traded that bad game for dark souls, the board game. <laughs> 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 oh, <laughs> we better wrap this up before we end at like one o'clock in the morning. So uh, that is 
is a part that is a part one of the best of the rest. Uh, we got we made it all the way up from 160 something to 97 or 94. 94 was myth, our overall. Uh, please, once again, go to our you know Patreon and YouTube and, and the podcast and all the places where we are and go to our Discord. Uh, Discord is very easy to join. We have a link in the, I will have a link in Shelf Stories and there's a link also in the, in the podcast notes uh, for the entire list. There's a lot of great games here that we are skipping over and I know we're skipping them over because we can't talk about everything. We would be here forever and this this is good enough. <laughs> We're here for <laughs> enough. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Peter, take us home on the podcast. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. And we'll talk to you next week. Bye. Bye.